Greetings and welcome everyone on the World Wide Web. We have James James Aiken Wiley's book, The History of Protestantism, today. I'm joined with Michael in Germany, and a warm welcome to you, Michael, today. Yeah, thank you very much, dear Brad. Thanks for inviting me. Looking forward to the continuation of the series, which I estimate could take a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, a little bit longer with 2,000 pages, and of course... Mm. You know, uh, your host here reading the pages. Uh, you know, I'm doing this as a, a service for everyone. It, you know, I'm learning along with everyone. I'm not claiming to be any authority here at all. I'm just your servant. So it's it's great to be here with you, Michael. And I'm really glad that we can touch on this. And, and you know, obviously, this is not going to be a very popular uh, topic, I think, in terms of uh, modern society. They're more interested in, you know, uh, the same old Roman ploy, right? Uh, bread and circus. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, well, uh, hey. You your know. bread and eat a circus. <laughs> 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 well, hey. Uh, we started, uh, you know, uh, some weeks ago on the premise of, well, this is something that is a very interesting topic. And of course, this is the target that the Counter-Reformation has been pursuing to destroy in the world. So, you know, to me, it makes much more sense to be reading this book than many other topics that I can think of, because this is this is really essentially what this entire Counter Reformation has been trying to eliminate from the world. And no wonder. I mean, you don't really see the church's church teaching or or uh, the churches uh, talking about their history very much. Um, I'm thinking that they have a lot more to hide than to share. You know these modern churches we have to live with. And uh, yeah, I, I simply do not agree with a lot of the teachings that are in a lot of these modern churches. They, they just fail to look at their history thoroughly, Michael. I, I just see it everywhere I look. Or they might look at the history, but they twist it like... Uh, like some other institution we've studied, you know, and um, that's really never been my intention to go that direction. I've always been wanting to look at these critical topics and to treat them accordingly, that they are important. This history is very important and it does have a place in, uh, in my heart and I hope many others, but who knows? It, it could be that, uh, you know, we've reached a point of no return as far as the Jesuits are concerned. And, um, well, hey, you know, um, there's always time for repentance as far as I'm concerned. People do, can and do change their minds. So uh, God hasten the day for all of you Roman folk out there to take a listen and consider very carefully uh, what the Spirit has to say about the Roman Church, because it's a very serious thing. It's not something to take lightly. A lot of different churches are, you know, intertwined with the Catholic Church, whether they know it or not. A lot of institutions are intertwined with the workings of Romanism without knowing it. And uh, yeah, the, the quicker they become aware of this history, the more apt they are to be prepared for what's coming. But back to James Aiken Wiley. In the book, we are on... Chapter 4, The Development of the Papacy from Gregory the Seventh to Boniface the Eighth. Okay, and we will proceed. Is there anything you'd like to contribute, Michael, before we depart into the chapter? 
Not yet. Okay, great. Well, here we go. Development of the papacy from Gregory the seventh to Boniface the eighth. We come now to the last great struggle. There lacked one grade of power to complete and crowned this stupendous fabric of dominion. The spiritual supremacy was achieved in the seventh century. The temporal sovereignty was attained in the eighth. It wanted only the pontifical supremacy, sometimes, although improperly, styled the temporal supremacy to make the Pope supreme over kings, as he had already become over peoples and bishops, and to vest in him a jurisdiction that has not its like on earth, a jurisdiction that is unique inasmuch as it arrogates all powers, absorbs all rights, and spurns all limits, destined before terminating its career to crush beneath its iron foot thrones and nations and masking an ambition as astute as Lucifer's with a dissimulation as profound this power advanced at first with noiseless steps and stole upon the world as night steals upon it. But as it neared the goal of its strides, grew longer and swifter, till at last it vaulted over the throne of monarchs into the seat of God. This great war we shall now proceed to consider. When the popes at an early stage claimed to be the vicars of Christ, they virtually challenged that boundless jurisdiction of which their proudest era beheld them in actual possession. But they knew that it would be to be imprudent, excuse me, indeed impossible as yet to assert it in actual fact. Their motto was spes messis in semi discern, uh, discerning, quote, at the harvest in the seed, unquote. They were content, meanwhile, to lodge the principle of supremacy in their creed and in general mind of Europe, excuse me, and in the general mind of Europe, knowing that future ages would fructif uh, excuse me, fructify and ripen it. Towards this, they began to work quietly, yet skillfully and preservingly. At length, came to overt and open measures. It was now the year 1073. The papal chair was filled by perhaps the greatest of all the popes, Gregory VII, the noted Hildebrand. Daring and ambitions beyond all who preceded and beyond most of those who have followed him on the papal throne, Gregory fully grasped the idea, the great idea of theocracy. He held that the reign of the Pope was but another name for the reign of God, and he resolved never to rest till that idea had been realized in the subjection of all authority and power spiritual and temporal, to the chair of Peter, quote, when he drew out, unquote, says Janus, quote, the whole system of papal omnipotence in 27 theses in his dictatus. These theses were partly mere repetitions or collaries of the Isidorian decretals. Partly he and his friends sought to give them the appearance of tradition and antiquity by new fictions, unquote. We may take the following as samples. The 11 maxims say, quote, the Pope's name is the chief name in the world. The 12th teaches that, quote, it is lawful for him to depose emperors, unquote. The 18th affirms that, quote, his decision to be withstood by none, but he alone may annul those of all men, unquote. 
The 19th declares that, quote, he can be judged by no one, unquote. The 25th vests him in absolute power of deposing and restoring bishops. And the 27th, the power of annulling all allegiance of subjects. Such was the gauge that Gregory flung down to the kings and nations of the world. We say of the world, for the pontifical supremacy embraces all who dwell upon the earth. Now began the war between the mitre and the empire. Gregory's object in this war being to wrest from the emperors the power of appointing the bishops and the clergy generally, and to assume into his soul, his own soul, irresponsible hands, the whole of that intellectual and spiritual machinery by which Christendom was governed. The strife was a bloody one. The mitre, though sustaining occasional uh, reverses, continued never, nevertheless to gain steadily upon the empire. The spirit of the times helped the priesthood in their struggle with the civil power. The age was superstitious to the core, and though in no wise spiritual, it was very thoroughly ecclesiastical. Okay, and I want to come back to this perhaps at the end of the session, because I think right now would not be a good time to go into the, the great detail here, but we'll do that at the end of the session. The age was superstitious to the core, and though no wise spiritual, it was very thoroughly ecclesiastical. The Crusades, too, broke the spirit and drained the wealth of the princes, while the growing power and augmenting riches of the clergy cast the balance ever more and more against the state. For a brief space, Gregory VII tasted in his own case, the luxury of wielding this more than mortal power. There came a gleam, though, the awful darkness of the tempest that he raised, not final victory, which was yet a century distant, but its presage. He had the satisfaction of seeing the Emperor Henry IV of Germany who had smitten, he had smitten with excommunication, barefooted and in raiment of sackcloth, waiting three days and nights at the castle gates of Canossa amid the winter's drifts, suing for forgiveness. But it was for a moment only that Hildebrand stood at this dazzling pinnacle. The fortune of war very quickly turned Henry, the man whom the Pope had sorely humiliated, became victor in his turn. Gregory died in exile on the promontory of Salerno, but his successors espoused his project and strove by wiles, by arms, and by anathemas to reduce the world under the scepter of the papal theocracy for the well for well nigh two dismal centuries, the conflict was maintained. How truly melancholy the record of these times. It exhibits to our sorrowing gaze many a stricken field, many an empty throne, many a city sacked, many a spot deluged with blood. Exclamation point. Now, Michael, did you want to make a comment uh, on him? Yeah. yeah, as I told you last time also about the Henry the fourth um, it's very interesting especially from a German standpoint because uh, yeah this Henry the fourth was uh, the German king and isn't it interesting that uh, almost uh, everybody knows the expression here the walk to Canossa which is then the Italian uh, location of the Pope or was <clears throat> but uh, Nobody talks about the papal supremacy against the world rulers. They treat this event as a kind of, yeah, that was a long time ago, 
but nobody sees the resemblance to the actual situation that uh, the Pope can excommunicate any worldly leaders. Therefore, he's just supreme because he can condemn them. And so that everybody is, is free of any charge who would just murder or slaughter any so-called pagan ruler who does not obey the Pope. And nobody sees the reference to today or mm -hmm. everybody thinks, oh, yeah, that's close to a thousand years ago. Uh, that was then, but now we have democracy. Hmm. So many, many people know, oh, yeah, uh, the walk to Canossa. Oh, yeah, there was a king who had to go to the Pope and uh, across the Alps and barefoot. Um, we have been taught this in school, but we were not taught the actual situation or the importance of this event. And so I just would like to point out, this is really... <laughs> This is just an example that uh, the history that's been talked uh, taught is just the history from the victors. And victor means Victoria, means the Roman goddess of uh, victory. <laughs> so it's also an English word, victory. But actually, your word victory comes from a Roman goddess. Hmm. No, I never knew that that's common knowledge in Europe. But I suppose, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Europe has a lot more history uh, than the states do, obviously, because we're quote unquote a new creation here uh, and let's say let's say brett this just that was the knowledge in the school 40 years 45 uh, years ago right right got it yeah yep. when our education system was far more better than today yeah that's true yes right Right, that's yeah. interesting. Very. You interesting. also have to remember that this Henry the Fourth of the German, the Holy Roman Reich, um, the, he was uh, being set in power as the emperor uh, when he was underage. Yeah, so he was born on the 11th of the 11th, so 11th of November 1050. Mm. And this uh, incident of the uh, walk to Canossa happened in uh, 1077, so which means that he was uh, 26 something. Hmm. Uh, so what do you know about anything? What do you know about the Bible when you are 26? Uh, yeah, not a whole lot, I would imagine. I, I would also imagine. Yeah. Yeah, but it's really so relevant uh, until today when you see that all these worldly so-called leaders which have been put in the face, our face, or just put in front of the television, that they just only play a minor role. But we know that minister just means a servant of the church. When you mm. see it literally in the etymology. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah? But we are just amateurs here. What do we know? You see that these so-called professed people, they would tell that, yeah, that is long ago. And now since the French Revolution and uh, the uh, founding of the United States, so there is democracy all over the Western world. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. why the European Union has... Uh, gathered together all the leaders of the OC, so-called um, sovereign countries of the United or the European Union have come together then in Rome uh, to sign the Treaty of the European Union in 2004 under the big statue of Pope Innocence. Huh? Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, yes, that's right. And that was, um, boy, wasn't that around the year 2000 or something? 2004. I have looked it up last yeah, week for, right. for research, so it was 2004. Right, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's a striking image, you know. Um, surely once you've studied these subjects, you just don't forget these things. I have a hard time imagining that uh, people are, I, I don't think that the majority of people is so dumbed down, especially mm. not the older ones. I think right. the problem that we have uh, that will arrive, uh, Brett, is that we are just being more and more getting older and the younger generations, uh, they are able and uh, it is legal for them to decide anything and they will decide on totally wrong foundations. And that's the thing that is really bugging me that I see that the education system oh, is... Oh, yeah, there's out. movies that have been made about that, too. Uh, Logan's Run, remember that one? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So these are these are ideologies that, you know, that our so-called ruling elite want to place in, in our... In our uh, in our mind that, uh, yeah, they want to, they want us to go that way and they're encouraging that way. But, you know, it's really up to those youngsters to, uh, to do their own research. And, you know, some of them do, and, uh, some of them are not so foolish to follow this, this path. 
that's been laid out. And, you know, um, who knows? I, I'm not going to be uh, able to predict the future here, but it, it could be a different outcome. Yeah, I, I don't know. You see that um, I have a hard time imagining when I told you that this Henry the Fourth was just 26 something when he was just yeah. being uh, excommunicated by the Pope. But I think that uh, his struggle that he had with the papacy uh, was more or less about all this, all of money. I mm -hmm. have a hard time imagining that it was about faith. So he, I don't want to count him as a real Protestant, you see. Right, of course. Of course. So this is just worldly terms here. Yeah, they are struggling and they have an argument about uh, about actually the money and the the, the position of the emperor and and it, oh, it's that just a question me. of power. Yeah, that hmm? reminds me of uh, that little little bit from history of uh, when who was it now? Uh, Jan Hus was mm. standing up against you know mm. the the clergy back in his day and uh, the emperor was forced to bring him to justice and they mm. put him to the stake and mm. you know uh that's uh that's another little portion of history that is very important because yeah, you know I think, that would also, I think that will also be covered by that book here but i the, think the, so the, the, the stress that Henry the Fourth had with the Pope, <clears throat> and the other way around, is about the investiture contro controversy, or investiture contest, oh. a conflict between the Church and the state in medieval Europe over the ability to choose and install bishops and abbots of monasteries there and the Pope himself. So it's about that who's ruling the country. Well, yeah, and I think we're going to get that right into that in the reading here. So I think it's going. Yeah, to yeah, and uh, but it's not. I, I, you see that as it is a part of the book, The History of Protestantism, <clears throat> I think that we should really sort out the facts. I have a hard time believing that he, at the age of 26, is a real Bible believer or, or so. I don't think yeah. so. Uh, other, You see that that uh, would be a very rare combination if you are a worldly king and a Bible believer just in one position. So therefore, I think it is just solely... Um, to make the point that who's running the show and uh, it's clearly the Pope running the show um, any way you, you like well, it. Well, I so. think, you know, that's that's interesting you bring that up because uh, I think that's really what, uh, what this life is all about is, um, you know, because the Bible does talk about kings that are righteous and, and that, uh, you know, are, are doing their best to serve God in their authority uh, as a, a worldly ruler, certainly, you know, that's something that could happen. But uh, with all of the temptations that come along with it, uh, we see that over and over in history and the Bible, too, that these these kings fail. They cannot perform. A man cannot serve two masters, Right. Mm -hmm. So there you go. I mean, it's a very big dilemma that they have to face. Yeah, and, and maybe we should also point out the fact, I do not know if it will be uh, content of the reading here of that book, because I have not read that book yet, uh, Brad, um, that the rulership of Henry IV is extremely close of the uh, struggle at uh, Canossa, the walk to Canossa in 1077 is uh, so close to Dictatus Papai in 1075. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think I think that's no coincidence uh, that the papacy then said, okay, now we have uh, promoted that in March 1075, and now there comes this uh, juvenile king uh, or emperor from uh, the Holy Roman Reich of German nations or whatever that was, was called in the day. I have not looked it up and I have not studied the subject, but uh, I think that is very close and it, uh, they needed to set an example. Yes, that, that's right. my feeling. Exactly. Yes, that's right. And that's what happened. And yeah, mm -hmm. in modern times, we have other people they had to set as an example, uh, like... Uh, yeah, not really the same in any kind of context, really. But, you know, you get the drift. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, should we get back to the yes. reading? Okay.
Uh, let's see. Okay, so, uh, but through all this confusion and misery, the idea of Gregory was preservingly pursued till at last it was realized and the mitre was beheld triumphant over the empire. It was the fortune or the calamity of Innocent III, 1198 through 1216, to celebrate this great victory. Now it was that the pontifical supremacy reached its full development. One man, one will again govern the world. It is with a sort of stupefied awe that we look back to the 13th, excuse me, the 13th century and see the foreground of the receding storm, this col uh, Colossus appearing itself in the person of Innocent III. On its head, all the mitres of the church and in its hand, all the scepters of the state. Quote, in each of the three leading objects which Rome has pursued, unquote, says Halem. Quote, independent sovereignty, supremacy over the Christian church, control over the princes of the earth, it was the fortune of this pontiff to conquer, unquote. Quote, unquote, Rome, he says again, quote, inspired during this age all the terror of her ancient name. She was once more mistress of the world and kings were her vassals, unquote. She had fought a great fight and now she celebrated an unequaled triumph. Innocent appointed all bishops. He summoned to his tribunal all causes from the gravest affairs of mighty kingdoms to the private concerns of the humble citizen. He claimed all kingdoms as his fiefs and all monarchs as his vessels and launched with unsparing hands the bolts of excommunication against all who withstood his pontifical will. Hildebrand's idea was now fully realized. The pontifical supremacy was held in its plenitude, the plenitude of spiritual power and that of temporal power. It was the noon of the papacy, but the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. The grandeur which the papacy now enjoyed and the jurisdiction it wielded have received dogmatic expression and one or two uh, selections will enable it to paint itself as it was seen in its noon. Pope Innocent III affirmed, quote, that the pontifical authority so much exceeded the royal power as the sun doth the moon, unquote. Nor could he find words fitly to describe his own formidable functions, save those of Jehovah to his prophet Jeremiah, quote, See, I have set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, unquote. Quote, the church is my spouse, unquote. We find the same Pope saying, quote, it is not married, excuse me, it is, is not married to me without bringing me something, she hath given me a dowry, a piece, a price, excuse me, a price beyond all price, the plentitude of spiritual things and the extent of things temporal, the greatness and abundance of both. She hath given me the mitre in token of things spiritual, the crown in token of things of the temporal, excuse me, the mitre of the priesthood and the crown for the kingdom making me the lieutenant of him who hath written upon his vesture and on his thigh, quote, King of kings and Lord of lords, unquote. I enjoy the, alone the plentitude of power that others may say of me next to God, quote, and out of, and out of his fullness have we received, 
unquote. We declare, says Boniface VIII in his bull, Unum Sanctum, quote, define pronouns it to be necessary to salvation for every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff, unquote. And a little comment from me, note the word human, please. This subjection is declared in the bull to extend to all affairs, quote, unquote, one sword, says the Pope, quote, must be under another and the temporal authority must be subject to the spiritual power. Whence, if the earthly power go astray, it must be judged by the spiritual, unquote. Such are a few of the quote-unquote great words which were heard to issue from the Vatican Mount, that new Sinai, which, like the old, encompassed by fiery terrors, had upreared itself in the midst of the astonished and affrighted nations of Christendom. What a contrast between the first and the last estate of the pastors of the Roman Church, between the humility and poverty of the first century and the splendor and power in which the 13th saw them enthroned. This contrast has not escaped the notice of the greatest of Italian poets. Dante, in his first, excuse me, in one of his lightning flashes, has brought us, be, brought it before us. He describes the first pastors of the church as coming and addressing Peter, he says, quote, And thou wentst forth in poverty and hunger to set goodly plant that, from the vine it once was, now is grown unsightly bramble, unquote. Petrarch dwells repeatedly with more amplification on the same theme. We quote only the first and last stanzas of his sonnet on the Church of Rome, quote, the fire of wrathful heaven alight, and all thy harlot tresses smite. Base city, thou from humble fare, thy acorns and thy water, rose to greatness rich with others' woes, rejoicing in the ruin thou didst bear, unquote. Quote, in former days thou was not laid on down, nor under cooling shade, thou naked to the winds was given, and thou the sharp and the sharp and thorny road, thy feet without thy sandals trod, but now thy life in such it smells to heaven. Unquote. There is something here out of the ordinary course. We have no desire to detract from the worldly wisdom of the popes. They were, in that respect, the ablest race of rulers the world ever saw. Their enterprise soared as high above the vast, the vastest scheme of other potentates and conquerors as their ostensible means of achieving it fell below theirs. To build such a fabric of dominion upon the gospel every line of which repudiates and condemns it, to impose it upon the world without an army and without a fleet, to bow the necks not of ignorant peoples only, but of mighty potentates to it, nay, to persuade the latter to assist in establishing a power which they could hardly but foresee would clash themselves to pursue this scheme through a succession of centuries without once meeting any serious check or repulse for the 130 popes between boniface the third 606 who in partnership with focus laid the foundations of papal grandeur and Greg gregory the seventh who tint realized it onward through 
other two centuries to Pope Innocent III, 1216, and Pope Boniface VIII in 1303, who at last put the top stone on it. Not one lost an inch of ground which his predecessor had gained. To do all this, we repeat something out of the ordinary course. There is nothing like it again in the whole history of the world. This success, though seven centuries, was audaciously interpreted into a proof of the divinity of the papacy. Behold, it had been said, when the throne of Caesar was overturned, how the chair of Peter stood erect. Behold, when the barbarous nations rushed like a torrent into Italy, overwhelming laws, extinguishing knowledge, and dissolving society itself, how the ark of the church rode in safety on the flood. Behold, when the victorious hosts of the Sassarin approached the gates of Italy, how they were turned back. Behold, when the mitre waged its great contest, with the empire, how it triumphed. Behold, when the Reformation broke out and it seemed as if the kingdom of the Pope was numbered and finished, how three centuries have been added to its sway. Behold, in fine, when revolution broke out in, in France and swept like a whirlwind over Europe, bearing down thrones and dynasties, how the bark of Peter out lived the storm and rode triumphant over the waves that engulfed apparently stronger structures. It is not, excuse me, is it not the church of which Christ said, quote, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, unquote? What else do the words of Cardinal Borneus mean? Excuse me, Baronius. What else did the words of the carnal carnal <laughs> what else do the words of cardinal boronius mean boasting of a supposed donation of the kingdom of hungary and to the roman sea by stephan he says quote it fell out by a wonderful providence of god that at the very time when the roman church might appear ready to fall and perish even then Distant kings approach the apostolic see, which they acknowledge and venerate as the only temple of the universe, the sanctuary, uh, sanctuary of piety, the pillar of truth, the immovable rock. Behold, kings, not from the east as of old, they came to the cradle of Christ, but from the north, led by faith, as they humbly approach the cottage of the fisher, the church of Rome herself, offering not only gifts out of their treasures, but bringing even kingdoms to her and asking kingdoms from her. Whoso is wise and will record these things, even he shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord." Unquote. But the success of the papacy was closely examined. It is not surprising as it looks. It is not so surprising as it looks. It cannot be justly pronounced legitimate or fairly won. Rome has ever been swimming with the tide. The evils and passions of society, which a true benefactress would have made it her business to cure, at least to alleviate. Rome has studied rather to foster into strength than she might be born to power on the foul current which she herself had created. Amidst, amid battles, bloodshed, and confusion has her path lain. The edicts of subservient councils, the forgeries of hireling priests, the arms of craven monarchs, and the thunderbolts of excommunication have never been wanting to open her path. Exploits won by weapons of this sort are what her historians delight to chronicle. 
These are the victories that constitute her glory. And then there remains yet another and great deduction from the apparent grandeur of her success in that, after all, it is the success of only a few, a caste, the clergy. For although during her early career, the Roman church rendered certain important services to society, of which it will delight us to make mention in fitting place when she grew to maturity and was able to develop her real genius, it was felt and acknowledged by all that her principles implied the ruin of all interests to save her own, and that there was room in the world for none but herself. If her march, as shown in history down to the 16th century, is ever onwards, it is not less true that behind, on her path, lie the wrecks of nations, the ashes of literature, the, uh, of liberty, and of civilization. Nor can we help observing that the career of Rome, with all the fictitious brilliance that encompasses it, is utterly eclipsed when placed beside the silent and sublime progress of the gospel. The latter, that is the gospel, we see winning its way over mighty obstacles solely by the force and sweetness of its own truth. It touches the deep wounds of society only to heal them. It speaks not to awaken, but to hush the rough voice of strife and war. It enlightens, purifies, and blesses men whenever it comes, and it does all this so gently and unboastingly. Reviled, it reviles not again. For it curses, it returns, for curses, it returns blessings, excuse me. It unsheathes no sword, it spills no blood. Cast into chains, its victories are as many as when free and more glorious, dragged to the stake and burned from the ashes of the martyrs, there start up a thousand confessors to speed on its career and swell the glory of its triumph. Compared with this, how different has, the, has been the career of Rome? As different, in fact, as the thundercloud which comes onward, mantling the skies in the gloom and scathing the earth with fiery bolts, is different from the morning descending from the mountaintop, scattering around it silvery light, the silvery light and awakening at its presence songs of joy. And that ends our chapter in the reading of this uh, history, development of the papacy from Gregory the Seventh to Boniface the Eighth. Now, I want to go over what we had covered earlier about the um, the thoroughly, uh, yeah, the thoroughly ecclesiastical. Okay. Um, this is something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, and let's just quick delve into it for a moment. Uh, yeah, ecclesiology, if we look this up, uh, it speaks of uh, its early history, one of the church's primary eschological, <laughs> eschological issues had to do with the statutes of Gentile members in what had become the New Testament fulfillment of the essentially Jewish Old Testament church. Okay, so what they're referring to here is in the book of Acts, right? When the gospel went to the Gentiles through Stephen, the, the, the martyrhood of Stephen. And later it contemned with such questions as whether it was to be governed by a council of presbyters or a single bishop. How much authority 
the Bishop of Rome had over other major bishops, the role of the church in the world, whether salvation was possible outside the institution. Okay, and we go la da 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 da. But essentially, we get to something called Catholic ecclesiology, okay? So this is not a small topic. This is this is a big one. Catholic ecclesiology today is a plurality of models and views, as with all Catholic theology, since the acceptance of scholarly biblical criticism that began in the early to mid 20th century, this shift is most clearly marked in the encyclical Divino uh, Finite Spiritu in 1943. Avery Robert Cardinal Dulles, S.J., contributed greatly to the use of the models in understanding ecclesiology. In his work, Models of the Church, he defines five basic models of the Church that have been prevalent throughout the history of the Catholic Church. These include models of the Church as institution, as mystical communion, as sacrament, as herald, and as servant. The ecclesiological model of Church as an institution holds that the Catholic Church alone is the, quote, one holy Catholic and apostolic Church, unquote, and is the only Church of divine and apostolic origin led by the Pope. This is true. This view is the Church is dogmatically defined Catherine Catholic doctrine, excuse me, and is therefore de fide. In this view, the Catholic Church composed of all baptized professing Catholics, both clergy and laity, is the unified, visible society founded by Christ himself. Wrong! And its hierarchy derives its spiritual authority through the centuries via apostolic succession of its bishops, most especially through the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, whose successorship comes from St. Peter, the Apostle, to whom Christ, quote-unquote, gave the keys to the kingdom of heaven, unquote. Thus, the Pope's in the Catholic view, have a God-ordained universal jurisdiction over the whole Church of the earth. The Catholic Church is considered Christ's mystical body and the universal sacram sacrament of salvation, whereby Christ enables human to receive sanctifying grace. Okay, notice the key word here, human. So, you know, it's very interesting when you look up humanity in, you know, an old dictionary. I have an old Oxford dictionary, and I happen to look up the word humanity here. And, uh, you know, early on when I started looking into this, uh, it appeared that uh, there was something incredibly strange here going on because— uh, the human race is referred to as mankind in 1579. Well, I think we had the Council of Trent going around 1570 or something. And uh, that's interesting. Also, it says here in part two under humanity that uh, this is one of the classes in a Jesuit school. So, yeah, that that has something to do with it. But, you know, when you take this further and you look up, you know, the philosophical term of human is humanism. And humanism states here uh, that uh, along with humanists used in a variety of philosophical and theological senses in the 16th and 18th centuries, especially ones concerned with the mere humanity of Christ. So what do you do when you make Christ human? You take away his divinity, and that's exactly what they have done. They have taken away the divine 
purpose of Christ. That's why when Pope Francis said when he came to greet Congress here in the United States back in 2015, he had said that, uh, humanly speaking, the Christ's, uh, what do you say? How do you say it? Humanly speaking, Christ's uh, sacrifice on the cross ended in failure. Something yeah, to yeah, that degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he I can't the remember cross, exactly. I think it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He stated that that uh, Christ failed at the cross. Well, humanly speaking, he failed because he was not divine. That's what the Pope is telling you. Mm. Because, you know, when you really grasp the humanity aspect, they're essentially just using Christ. They they don't they don't have any real faith in the divinity of Christ. Obviously, this is just usurpation. They're taking the place of Christ, aren't they, Michael? Yeah, but uh, no wonder, because uh, there's, it's the only uh, path that you could claim this apostolic succession, succession. And when you talked about uh, that, um, about the stoning of Stephen. Yes. Um, in the context of, please help me out, Oh, yeah, the context at the beginning here um, with the, uh, that would be... Oh, that was in a text from this book, The History of uh, Protestantism. Oh, it uh, is, and, okay. And now you, you talked about this uh, kind of like, uh, yeah, that was the stoning of Stephen when then the um, the gospel then was, was preached. Um, actually, that the stoning of Stephen was in chapter 8, and if I remember correctly, was it in chapter eight? I have to look it up. But mm -hmm. what 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 I really know is that the gospel then went to the Gentiles after Saul, then called Paul, um, said to the Jews, uh, "I'm sorry because uh, you, you did not want you don't know do not want to hear it." And it is in 1346. Then then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, speaking of the Jews. Yep. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, uh, yo, we turn to the Gentiles. So it was Paul who then decided that the gospel should have been preached to the Gentiles. So it is clearly Paul, former Saul, who is the apostle to the Gentiles. Correct. So therefore, yes. mm -hmm. Peter could not be the apostle to the Gentiles. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Rome, these Romans, they were Gentiles. Yeah. They were not Jews. Yeah, right. So therefore, their totally apostolic succession is an absolutely fabrication, which you see also in Acts chapter 13. Right. Yeah. It's just, I want to back up your claims. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, wasn't uh, Acts chapter 8 uh, with, um, with, that has to do with... Uh, Simon. Simon Magus, yeah, that yeah, too. Just it's a very, there. very, very good study, the Book of Acts. But yeah, that was here in this, in this, um, in the early. It's in this sentence here in its early history. One of the church's primary, es, excuse me, ecclesiological issues had to do with the status of Gentile members in that in what had become the New Testament fulfillment of the essentially Jewish Old Testament church. That's what I was referring to. Okay, I have to correct myself a bit because it was Acts chapter 7 what the stoning of Stephen was. Ah, yes. But okay, you God. see that it's just hard to uh, no, recollect I, everything I in one's it's, brain. It's but, close enough though, Michael. Thank you for yeah, but, it up. But the, the point is that the apostolic succession is totally a fabrication because you know that Peter was not the apostle man to be preaching to the Gentiles. You're and correct. Rome, You're absolutely and correct. Rome was, Rome was ever, ever, they're ever, 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 the mixing. enemy of the Jews. Yeah, they're just trying to confuse all of Christendom, of course. I mean, that's their purpose because they, they want to take away your ability to read and think for yourself. To you claim, know? Yeah, to claim that Rome is the epicenter of the so-called Christian belief, yeah, would be the same as you would claim that uh, 
What else to say? That uh, Moscow is the capital city of the United States. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's absolutely a, it's, it's a joke. It's, it's beyond it's, beyond it's any belief. You see. When I was young, and I, I know I knew that the that there was a Roman soldier who put his uh, spear into Jesus' side. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so and and that Rome was responsible for destroying the temple in 70 AD. So how can anybody come up with the great illusion that Rome is the epicenter of Christianity, so-called Christianity? I, I I could not. When I was a juvenile, I, I said, okay, now I'm sorry, this is not the Church of Jesus Christ because they are just simply too wealthy. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, there's a lot of contradictions there, and if you just go with the tradition of it all, you just accept it all and blindfully, oh yeah, well they got to be right. You know, look how successful they are. Yeah, but that kind of thing. Book you is, know? Th this book is so interesting because every time that you're reading the book, not only because you're a native English speaker or American speaker, but um, it is just uh, this uh, elaborate, eloquent English. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which you don't hear on any news today or any no. regular sources today. You see that this is really these reformers or not reformers. It's a it's it's a bad word maybe because it cannot be reformed. These Protestants. Yes. Um, that I think that the better the better word for that is evangelicals. Yeah, sure. because these people mm -hmm. who are just uh, keeping busy with the truth and uh, with all the content of the Bible, um, these are really the people who are just want to have some science, some knowledge in it. They are just yes. much more uh, professed in, uh, well, just uh, how to say that in English. Well, let's say um, it, it's science in the sense that we're we're pursuing a righteous science here. This is this is the study of of you know what is god's word what is god's purpose what does he say in scripture what does he really say you know i always wanted to know this and and this is something that we all need to wrestle with it's not something that is just going to be easily given to you like on a silver platter no you have to go figure it out and do your own research right i mean you have to own this truth it's not something that you can easily acquire. It takes study. It takes, uh, obviously, it took James Aiken Wiley a great amount of, of uh, study to come to these conclusions. But I'm, I'm really, really happy that we have this text that, uh, that was put together by um, Alec there at uh, Lutheran Bible uh, Library. LutheranLibrary.org, O-R-G, excuse me, and uh, it's great. I mean, I, I really feel like uh, finally something to get a grasp on, you know, what, what's really happened in the past. So... I think the big difference, Brett, is also well, we're not. I'm not talking now about the the priests or the, the pastors or whomsoever else in the clergy, but for the layman, I think that among the evangelicals, or at least it used to be, it should be, um, these people are just knowing their Bible. And uh, I see from the majority, which are in the big churches, especially uh, Catholics. They don't read their Bible. They're just forwarding the sermon on their priest. They say, okay, yeah, that sounds good. And uh, they don't care about much for the Bible. And that's a sad well, thing. It, I think that that's, that's the why thing. they are so deluded. Right. Well, when you when you sit there and listen to Latin all day and you don't even care what they're saying, I mean, they're singing songs to Lucifer there in the church. I mean, you'd think that they'd actually get it, but they don't because it's just the God of this world. You know, mm. big difference between the God of this world and the God of glory in heaven. Big difference mm. there. You, you can worship the God of this world. Yes, you can think he's righteous. Yes. But when it comes down to the end of the day, you know, uh, it's different because you have a form of righteousness. It's not that it's righteous. It's a form of righteousness. And you need to know where the history of that church started and how they have deceived you. Because we're not to let men deceive us. That's what Jesus commanded us. We're not to just sit there and listen to what anyone has to say. Just go and prove it 
you know, with your own research and don't believe them because they said it. Don't believe just because they said it's true. You know, it doesn't mean it's true. You got to prove it. You have to check it. You have to make sure of it before. I mean, that's what faith is all about, is actually proving through various testimonies, you know, whether it's true or false. That's not an easy process either. But yeah, next time we're going to come to the medieval Protestant witness. Uh, God willing, we make it here next week. And um, be looking forward to joining up with you, Michael, if you're available. And uh, we'll see what, you know, we'll see what the future brings, because there's a lot of talk right now. Uh, I was watching some video last night about uh, cyber attacks and, you know, a lot of a lot of rhetoric going on right now mm. about, uh, you know, the uh, fragility of uh, of the whole financial network and all of that. So I think uh, it's pretty obvious that we're in for something big here in the next couple of years. So we'll see what happens, but uh, God willing, we'll we'll meet every week and continue in our reading and discussion of the history of Protestantism. Thanks for joining me, Michael. Yeah, thanks for having me. And we'll see everyone next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>